Calvin Shahar of Harvard University, Dermot, Ellen Langer, Stephen Pinker, Dan Gilbert, and more. Based on Harvard's popular happiness class, incorporating the leading studies on life, work, and overall well-being. We want to share this database of knowledge of researchers around the world. The hardest work is actually like quieting the mind, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, connecting clearly with the world. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Good evening, Cambridge. It is Shalhavit Simcha, and welcome to Emotional Talk. Um, I finally got a small open for the beginning for an introduction of what this show is going to be more, which is dealing with positive psychology and research in positive psychology. Um, so today I wanted to, uh, before I introduce a surprise guest that we're going to have sitting here real soon, I wanted to share with you an experiment that was very mind-opening for me. And something very, very interesting if we really connect it later to Valentine's Day. Um, So the story took place in Cambridge um, in the 1950s, so that's 60 years ago. Um, They took a group, uh, it was a a scientific experiment in psychology, it was called the Cambridge Somerville Youth Study, and I could show you the book. Um, The book uh, you could find online, you could order it on Amazon. It is... Uh, an Experiment in Prevention of Delinquency, the Cambridge Somerville Youth Study. Um, they took t- uh, groups of children, um, middle school and high school, and the ages, and basically those ages of, um, of high school and middle school, um, 200 students that did not know who was assigned for what. So the students really didn't know what the experiment was or anything. And it was a 20-year uh, study that once you hear about it, you might not agree with it, which is really why you can't do that anymore today, but it's a really mind-blowing experiment. Um, back then, it was you know, the Mozart baby, the belief that you know, if you really encourage a kid and, and give the kid everything that he needs and you know, all the love and all the attention and all the feedback, um, you know, you're great, you're amazing, you're wonderful, you're great, you're amazing, you're wonderful. And the belief is that once you get so much positive feedback, you probably thrive. And I'm going to explain soon why it's so mind-blowing. So 100 students received all the help and support that was believed and still mostly believed that is helpful or intuitively is believed to be helpful. And that's what I like about psychology because you try and you experiment and you see what works. Um, So it goes as follows. They got um, counselors, personal counselors, to help them with schoolwork, they got a lot of feedback telling them that they're good, that they're wonderful, that they're amazing. Um, anything you think a kid could have. Um, medical help, uh, youth movements, right? Social help, and, um, and th- this was the 100 kids. The other 100 kids, and the, the students didn't know. Sometimes it could be two children from the same family. The other 100 did not get any of these. No extra medical help, no help in school, even if they applied for. And for some reason, they didn't get into the youth movements because that was the experiment, seeing how much the the help would be helpful. Um, So I'm going to go over with you um, just to see the chapters of the book. If you could see here um, on the the table of contents, you have how the idea becomes reality and the settings that they give them um, and how they choose every kid. And, you know, they basically try to do it as random as possible. Um, no, no one that shows that they're better or anything, assigning them to counselors. Um, and it's a very, very interesting book. And it basically took 20 years, where every five years they came in to do an intervention and follow up with the students and really see how they're doing. 
And as I said, the, the title of the experiment was about delinquency. Because um, they figured that the students that won't get a lot of help would, you know, just hang out and get really bored and become more delinquent. And, you know, clearly you can't do that today. You can't just not give help to, to kids. It's totally not okay. There was, this was done in um, 1951. Um, so today, uh, well, after 20 years, right, so after 20 years they found, um, you know, they basically came and checked how much difference in delinquency uh, there is between the two groups. Um, and apparently there was no difference in, in how much violence or delinquency um, those kids um, expressed, right? So you have all those students that get help and all the students that didn't get any help. And there was really no difference, you know, slight, slight differences in the curves, but really no better or worse for, for either cases uh, in terms of delinquency. But there was a big difference in something else, actually two other aspects. Also, um, there wasn't any difference in their health levels. So health also, not a big difference, which is really interesting. But there was a big difference in uh, how much unemployment and how much addiction to drugs and alcohol um, there was. One group showed much more addiction and much more unemployment, and that was in the wrong group. The group that did not get help um, were actually much better off. With the group that got all the help and all the support and all the positive feedback and reassurance um, showed to be much more addicted and much more alcoholic and, and much more unemployed. And, you know, like a lot of experiments in psychology, you know, you kind of think that you're studying one thing and the results come and you're like, wow. And you got to ask again and, and you learn new things. And what they found, um, you know, so in those interventions, they give the students little puzzles to build, right? Um, and they told them these puzzles are very, very difficult. This is, they're very challenging. And the group that got all the help, now that they are not getting any help, you know, facing a very challenging mission, they don't want to do it. Because their perception of their self is that they're so great and they're so good, they can't break that. They can't break how they perceive themselves anymore. They can't break that, you know, you're perfect, you're amazing, you're great. So they don't, they don't want to take a new challenge. The other students had to take challenges all their lives. There's always something difficult and there's always something that's challenging to overcome. So they did much better in the puzzle. And similar in other assignments, um, and um, I, was, I was introduced to this research at, in the Harvard Happiness class in Positive Psychology. But Talvin Schaffer was explaining how, you know, they, they had follow-up research uh, for this specific and, and more in education, where they find that when we encourage the, the child, um, only when the child comes home and, you know, shows us how great he is, you know, so we're reinforcing, you're great, you're wonderful, you got an A, um, you know, and then we give the child the lollipop, then the child learns that only if they're perfect, then, then, then they could be happy. You know, if something is difficult, we don't usually give them the, the, the feedback. We, we don't say, oh, you're doing such a, you know, you're working so hard. The reinforcement usually in our lives is, is when you get there. And it kind of builds a perception in our head that only when we get there, we're going to be praised. So the process is really not praised and you know, and if we just strive for the, for the, you know, you're so great, you're so wonderful, uh, then we tend to want to work less. And we, we want to do the, you know, we, we want to take it easy and uh, we want to get the easy way out. So those kids would probably pay their friends to do their work for them because the goal is just to get there. The goal is not the way. Um, it's only to be wonderful. And, you know, I'll pay someone to do the work for me. And Talvin Shachar was talking about it, how um, Talvin Shachar gave the, the Harvard Happiness class. And he, um, he's talking about how when he went to the championships in, um, in sports, he was playing sports and, um, and he won a big prize. And he said that, you know, all of his life he was waiting to get this, it was squash. And, you know, and he got the prize and he remembered coming home and for a few minutes he was like, you know, this like high of like, wow, he got the prize. And then he felt empty because you know, because we always train to look for a goal. We train to look for, you know, for getting there. But because we're always trained to get there, then our mind doesn't know what it is to be there. 
So once you're there, you're already thinking of the, to get there next, because most of the, you know, most uh, nature of processes is that, you know, the process part is the longer part. The beginning and the end are, you know, very minor. You know, life is always processes. You know, there's only one end. We all know it, and I don't know how much you really feel and experience when you get there, um, which is when you die. So, you know, it's, it's really the process, and, and, you know, we have that perception that, you know, that we should only get there. And Talbin Shachar says how he tries to encourage his child, David, now, to say, you know, oh, you're working so hard, that's so wonderful. Because, you know, the hard work is, is really what should be praised. And, you know, our mindset, we should train ourselves a little bit more to, to be in the process and to enjoy the process and, and the work. And it's really hard to uneducate yourself or to re-educate yourself. But, you know, the wonderful thing is that our brain is made from pathways and neurons. And when you kind of repeat the same thought over and over, that neuron in your brain keeps on shooting and shooting, and, you know, it's kind of like a muscle. You train it and it becomes thicker. Same thing with our head. You train yourself with a thought and it becomes thicker. So it is possible to change. Change is possible, but it takes a lot of practice. The beginning, it's, um, it's difficult. The beginning, you know, it's not, you know, it's not what you're used to. It's, it's a very, very thin nerve that you're, that you're working with. But eventually, that transmitter is going to work and work. Um, and what I'm saying is, is encouraging ourselves to the process. And I wanted to connect that with Valentine's Day. Um, because a lot of us are out there looking for the perfect, looking for the ultimate something, right? The ultimate relationship. Um, I, I just personally just ended a relationship last night and that was, um, it made me think a lot. And you know, what am I going to celebrate on Valentine's Day? Was it tomorrow or in two days? So, you know, so, you know, here I am and I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, I'm not celebrating a, you know, a communication with someone because that broke. So I f kind of feel like a failure, and I'm not, I'm not celebrating the getting there. Um, but then again, I'm, you know, I just realized, you know, I, there's this whole like, you know, celebrating my myself, you know, my process with myself of where do I want to get, you know, the love between me and myself. And I wanted to share with you a really beautiful quote uh, by Nathaniel Brandon. He's one of the I guess world leaders on, on self-esteem um, study. So here it goes. The first love affair we must consummate successfully is a love affair with ourselves, to enjoy our own being, to be happy in a profound sense with who we are, to experience the self as worthy of being valued and loved by others. This is the first requirement for the growth of romantic love. This is by Nathaniel Brandon talking about love with ourselves. And, you know, I kind of decided that, you know, on Thursday I'm going to just try and do something that I really like, uh, not judge myself if I'm there or, you know, just try and enjoy the process and try and do something that I just really enjoy. Um, so I'd like to encourage you guys to, to celebrate, you know, and just be good to yourself um, because that is really that love. And, you know, and saying that, I just want to be mindful of, it's not about getting there. It's not about, oh my God, I love myself so much. Because you never really get there. Again, you only get there. There's only one there that is finite that you get to that is, you know, that it's the final get to that there's no return from. And that is death. Um, so life is always process. And I just kind of want to call out there and say, you know, let, let's uneducate ourselves from the, the getting there. Let's try and enjoy the process because we're all really hard workers. We're all working really, really hard. And, you know, I'm sitting here at CCTV and I see people walking outside. Um, and it's just interesting because, you know, people are walking, some of them are just like smiling and, you know, waving. And everyone, you know, when you look outside or just around you, every person around you went through something, a big crisis, uh, you know, either a loved one that died or, you know, family member or, you know, breakup. And, we're built with this resiliency. Um, Steven Pinker talks about it in his uh, class of, of developmental psychology, of evolution psychology, just you know how we're evolved to be resilient. Um, and here's the moment to remind us all, uh, what I usually start my show with, is remember to eat, drink, and sleep. You know, these are three requirements for self-love. Um, if you did not sleep enough, take a nap, because it's really hard to be in a good place if you didn't sleep enough. 
maybe that's what you want to do on Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, sleeping uh, enough, um, drinking enough, and eating well. That's like, you know, every three or four hours. You know, take care of your body to be in a better place. Um, so, you know, there, there are endless amount of things that you could keep on doing and, and you, sh you need to keep on doing. And this, this is the journey. And this is what we should strive to. Unless you want to get to be unemployed or, what was it, addicted to things. Because, you know, those addictions are, you know, just the getting there. You know, getting to that high feeling. But if you really train yourself to, you know, and again, it's a practice. Training yourself to be in an okay place. Um, and I kind of feel like it's so easy for me to sit here and preach because um, I'm sitting here and preaching. Um, but it's, it's something that, you know, I just, I just wanted to share um, my moment of journey. And I really wanted to talk about this experiment, uh, this experiment because it's so mind-blowing and, and awesome. Um, but, uh, yeah, I wanted to call out and, and just share that, that we're all in the process and we're all in a way to get somewhere. Um, and I want to set goals um, because I think that kind of setting our goals are... Um, they set our mind state. They set, they set where we're, where our focus. So when you say something, when you talk about something, you're going to notice it more. Um, so I was recently in the hospital, and at a certain point I'm going to share with you uh, what I was going through. But we set our goals every morning, and then every night we, visit, we revisited our goals. You know, and usually it's a mindset. It's a mindset that you wanted to be in. And it's, this is one way of, of, um, of really influencing yourself. Just state, you know, I want to be in that mindset or I want to do my laundry tonight. You're going to notice it because, you know, you stated it and you, you set a goal. I'm going to probably have a whole um, lecture or show about goal setting. Um, so my, um, my goal for tonight and for Valentine's Day is I want to be just very inspired. And I want to be, I would like to be influenced by my own words um, because I think sometimes it's so easy to say things. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's just easy for it to come and, and go through you. Um, so in these words, I'd like to be present. And, um, yeah, I'd like to be present on Valentine's Day. Uh, and, you know, and also today I'm going to tell you soon why. Uh, because if you're not present, again, you kind of miss the train. You kind of miss the happening. You miss the event. Um, and really, the, you know, the present is all you have. So my goal is to be present. And... And this uh, part of this is because my mom is here from Israel to visit me for four days, and I want to call mommy <laughs> and sit really close to me so we can see you. Hello. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, <coughs> so everyone, hi. This is my mom. She <laughs> made me. Um, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> mommy, thank you so much for coming for my show. <laughs> And thank you for coming to America for me. My mom flew 13 hours from Israel, um, and just for four days, just for me. And I should... I where should, should I look? In the camera? Yeah, the camera's right there. Ah, it's down. Yeah, you can also look up wherever you like. Whatever. It's a free country. <laughs> Hi, Eva. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I want to be present because, I, you know, you're only here for four days, and, you know, it's so easy for me to get... Um, I think also with family, like, you know, it's so easy to get to, like, the nitty-gritty, like, oh, I'm upset she said this or she did that, you know, especially with family, it's the hardest things, and, um, yeah, and I want to be present, I just want to experience, and I would like to be inspired, I'm already inspired, uh, I think we're both inspired by each other, um, true. you know, I'm like a little you, and you're inspiring me by you getting, you know, going on this journey, and, and hopefully I'm going to maybe do a little journey to San Francisco now that I saw you doing this big journey to me. Maybe I should love myself more and <laughs> afford a little journey too. Yeah, um, you're like extension of my ideas. I love to see you. I was really, uh, you know, I didn't know if I'm going to participate or not because it's, uh, it's really exciting to be uh, or talking to a camera. It's not my thing, you know. I'm not talking to cameras. <laughs> but then I say, when I'm going to participate? When, I'm, when am I going in? And uh, I say, she doesn't need me, but then she said that there's going to be a surprise, so <laughs> I have to come and, <laughs> I always need and you. say something. So, 
I was thinking about this uh, idea that you were sharing. Um, should I look at this camera or that one? You could look at me, you could look there, you could okay. look at <laughs> the, the small one there is, the one on top of the clock is where you see. Okay. And when, where they see you looking straight uh, into their eyes. Okay, okay. So uh, I just wanted to um, talk about the idea of being in the present and uh, something that I understand lately from my teachers is that um, <clears throat> when you have goals and you set up goals and you're looking uh, forward for your goals, uh, this, it's very good, but you should always leave some space for the unknown. Uh, because if you know, so you're limiting yourself for what you know. So while you're going and trying to achieve your goals, just leave a, just leave a space for the unknown to really come and make your goals a little bit more um, uh, present. I really like that. Okay, so. It's, I think it's kind of, um, so I grew up very religious or religious home, like the whole God, you know, like, you know, the whole, just your words kind of resonated with me. Like the unknown is kind of like, you know, that perception of God. And, um, you know, I kind of feel like now personally, my perception has changed in terms of titles, but like, you know, but I still really believe in that education. Um, and I think the whole concept of God is, you know, you have that unknown. And maybe I feel like in Judaism, there's a lot, a lot of talk about being present. You know, the whole Shabbat, you know, the Sabbath is, is being present and, and letting God in. And, and I really love that because, you know, first of all, I believe that our ancestors wanted the best for us. So they really developed this accumulated, you know, knowledge that they wanted to teach us. And, um, you know, and, and when I tap into it and, and I get it, I, I really like it because that is pretty brilliant. And, you know, leaving that space for the unknown. Yeah. Um, it's like not limiting yourself for what you know. There's always something that is um, like uh, there's always uh, influences yeah there's, there's always influence. something else that you didn't think about that is going to be participating in your in your way so so you should like keep your eyes and see the whole the whole pictures huh. and um so you guys don't know but my friend michal melinda is sitting right here and she said you know throw in some english i mean some hebrew uh, so my mom just said mashpia, which is influence in Hebrew, but it also comes from, from the word shefa. Everything in Hebrew has like a, a root and a reason and uh, mysticism, and it's great and it's fun because it's a lot of you know you could you know it's a lot of intellectual games that you play with. Like why is this the root of this and how does this word connect to that? So you know th so she said there's always this influence mashpia that's from around, but then the word shefa, which means abundance, like. I kind of feel like if you're always present and let yourself be open to the unknown, then you're also open to this, this abundance that comes from everywhere. Um, and I, I think I mentioned Barbara Fredrickson from UCLA studying the, um, it's called the um, broadening and building, because when, when you're in a negative space, it's like a narrow, you only see like, it's a tunnel vision, you only see that problem. Um, but, you know, but being open, you know, even going for a walk, seeing different views, something that you, you also taught me. You know, it's opening yourself for, for the unknown, for new thoughts and just opening your mind. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, once they have, I think it's in the Gestalt uh, practice. So uh, they made us uh, walk from a distance of like 100 uh, meters, something like that. But they say, you don't walk straight. You should notice this, the color of the sky, uh, you should listen to the wind or the birds, and you should uh, see how how much you know all, all kinds of uh, things in the nature. And uh, I was practicing it, and I realized this is the first time I really uh, have the longest breath in my life, because when you are uh, aware of everything that is around you. The, the weather, the, the sun, the, the colors, the wind. So, so you really breathe much more. And I uh, did an uh, exercise with Shalavit this morning. She usually oh, gets, uh, she, she wants to, to be, uh, you know, uh, I'm a little perfectionist. Fit. So she's like uh, doing. Uh, oh, I was lifting. Lifting. <laughs> and, 
And then she was lifting it, and then I saw she's a little tired. So I told her, you know, Shalavit, I have a, a nice exercise for you, and I think you should practice it. Uh, just play with somebody. Uh, he's like holding his hand like this, and you sh you're trying to uh, put it down. it down. And then uh, you put your hands on his chest and give him uh, three breaths. He's going to breathe three times. And then you uh, are trying again to uh, do this. And it's amazing. <laughs> it's this really is, amazing. You just is... become so strong. Um, yeah, so three breaths. I remember Tom and Shachar talking about it. There's actually a whole book called Three Breaths and Three Deep Breaths. Maybe by you putting your hand on someone else's chest, you're helping them breathe in because you're giving them the time and space because by yourself sometimes it's hard and you know that's the whole social element. Um, but yeah, maybe for Valentine's Day, I, I guess I'd best you all to take three deep breaths. Um, and tell her, tell her if it works or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Send me an email. Um, I have my name is right on the bottom of this. We have 30 seconds left, so. Um, this is the quote that I opened my show with. Since life is what we perceive, changing our opinion could be just changing our reality. But if you see my name, this is Shalavit. You could just do that at gmail.com and just feel free to email me um, with thoughts or, you know, sharing whatever you want to share. Again, it's shalavit, S-H-A-L-H-A-V-I-T at gmail.com. Um, so you could just email me or Facebook me um, and take three deep breaths. I love you so much and thank you for being with us. Have a nice Valentine Day. Love yourself. You should love yourself like you should 